Before we discuss liberalism in the context of 21st century American politics, we need to clarify our terms. We are used to thinking of liberals and liberalism as the beliefs and policies associated with the Democratic Party. In broad terms, we can identify two related but distinct strains of American liberalism. The social liberalism we associate with universal civil rights and their extension to marginalized groups, and the economic liberalism associated with an expanded governmental role in economic regulation, labor relations, and the welfare state. This was the general meaning of liberal politics from the New Deal through the civil rights movement, up until the conservative ascendants under Ronald Reagan turned the word liberal into a kind of insult. The long period of conservative dominance since 1980 turned the term into a political liability, which is part of the reason why the term progressive has come to replace liberal in many contexts. But we must first be clear that these definitions of liberalism are only applicable to the American context. We might call these subcategories of the much broader philosophical, economic, and political movement called liberalism. This current of thought emerged in Northwestern Europe in the course of the 18th century Enlightenment. Liberalism in this sense is a diverse and varied phenomenon. On the one hand, it was an insurgent political theory that agitated for freedom of thought, freedom of speech and association, and the freedom to trade. It prized the individual conscience above the traditional claims of church and crown. It fueled the rise of capitalism and a dynamic international culture of innovation. On the other hand, it justified stark economic and political inequality. It countenanced slavery and other forms of coerced labor, and it relentlessly battered down traditional institutions that stood in the way of organizing society to conform to the needs of capitalism. Consider John Locke, the English liberal pioneer who decisively influenced the American revolutionaries and the authors of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Locke's theories of individual freedom and the absolute right to property animated the ideals of liberty that sustained years of revolutionary warfare against the British Empire. But Locke also accepted slavery as compatible with his theory of liberal freedom, and in fact helped write the first slave code for the Carolina colony. In the mid-20th century, the American political scientist Louis Hartz argued that what made American political culture unique was that the United States was the first republic founded on the principles of liberalism. The British colonies laid the foundations of their core political and economic order just as liberal ideas and practices were being articulated. Liberal ideas are the seedbed of American political thought, Hartz argued, and all of the trends and developments in American politics are rooted in that tradition. By contrast, liberalism in Europe and Latin America was a more militant movement, since in these cases, liberals faced the entrenched hostility of religious institutions and absolutist governments. Hence, liberalism developed more revolutionary tendencies under conditions where it had to fight to establish itself. But in North America, Hart says, philosophical liberalism was taken for granted, so much so that Americans have internalized its ethic, even if they've never heard of people like John Locke or Adam Smith. In America, we're all liberals, Democrat and Republican alike. That is, despite their differing agendas and interests, the political parties take for granted the fundamental rules of limited government, civil liberties, and the peaceful transition of power. Now, Hartz was writing at a time when it was common to argue that American politics was defined more by consensus than by conflict. In the era of post-World War II prosperity, a high premium was placed on displays of national unity, based on political compromise and coalition building. While it is true that by some measures the middle decades of the 20th century in American politics were defined by high levels of national cohesion and political stability, this period was an aberration from a deeper historical pattern marked by conflict and acrimony. 
The consensus view ignores the extent to which American politics is intensely racialized, a source of persistent trends of hierarchical and domineering politics. It drastically plays down the history of class conflict and the stark, violent struggles between labor and capital that defined the period between the Civil War and the New Deal. Moreover, the present-day radicalization of the Republican Party away from the norms and ideals of liberal democracy undermines the value of the consensus view as a means of explaining long-term developments in the United States. But there is value to the argument that philosophical liberalism permeates the American political imagination. Unlike most of its peer countries, the United States has remained committed to the ideal of the so-called free market economy and an anti-statist suspicion of activist government. Though this persistence has many explanations, it is undeniable that the kind of folk liberalism that informs our political culture, with its absolute claims of individual liberty and the right to do what one wants, has helped to shape these outcomes. Finally, there is the contested concept of neoliberalism. The term gets thrown around a lot in contemporary debates. Neoliberalism refers to a new form of liberal economic and political practice that arose after World War II and is identified with the rise of conservative politics in Ronald Reagan's America and Margaret Thatcher's United Kingdom. This ideology claimed that the key to generating wealth and social harmony was to unleash the private sector to compete in open markets, free of the restraints of state regulation, but also aided by partnerships with the state. Following the collapse of the Soviet Union, neoliberalism was globalized and became the dominant ethos of aggressively expanding capitalist relations in Eurasia, Africa, East Asia, and Latin America. One often hears the argument that both the Democratic and Republican parties are neoliberal, insofar as they both embrace policies and rhetoric that prioritize the private sector over the public sector, and demand that individuals make themselves fit to compete in the market. For our purposes, it is fair to say that neoliberal ideas are prominent in both parties, but they are being increasingly challenged. In the Democratic Party, the left-wing progressives and democratic socialists have aggressively challenged this ideology, while the white nationalist and anti-globalist factions that make up the MAGA movement have largely seized power from the more neoliberal establishment of the Republican Party. I know I've run the risk of being impossibly confusing here, but I want to point out that the complexities discussed are a reminder to think critically about these terms and the definitions that we so casually toss around in our politics. Now, our readings today are meant to orient us toward the core issues that animate that form of American liberalism we associate with the modern Democratic Party. We are starting with one of the last public speeches of the architect of modern American liberalism, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Roosevelt and his New Deal Democrats transformed the relationship between the citizen and the government. Sweeping reforms addressed banking, manufacturing, agriculture, labor unions, big business, and virtually every other distinct interest in the country. With Social Security and the minimum wage, the New Deal laid the foundations for the welfare state. In his last State of the Union address, Roosevelt took stock of the course of the Second World War and looked forward to the project of post-war reconstruction. In 1944, the burning question of the day was how to create the conditions for a durable peace, one that would make another such war impossible. In this context, FDR spoke about extending the contours of the New Deal in order to achieve this stability. Whereas the first Bill of Rights focused on protecting the citizen from the state, this second Bill of Rights would focus on the duty of the state to protect the citizen. This kind of bold progressivism always encounters ferocious opposition from the anti-statist consensus in American politics, and Roosevelt's proposals here were no exceptions. They were never adopted, and in fact, their influence waned dramatically as the Democrats abandoned the legacy of the New Deal in the 1970s and 1980s. But the recent dramatic resurgence of a democratic left in conjunction with a series of economic disasters has revived the agenda of economic liberalism and its insistence of security for all. Roosevelt identifies the right to housing, health care, and education. 
Taken together, these are the three central pillars of most modern welfare states, which seek to remove the essentials of life from the pressures of the market. The traditionally weak American welfare state has never embraced the idea of a right to housing, though the struggle to acknowledge a right to health care has progressed, while the right to an education remains to be defended and expanded. What's more, the right to a job, a living wage, and social security broke with the traditional American insistence that individuals compete on the market for these things, but as rewards rather than as guarantees. Again, this high water mark of liberalism quickly receded in the face of a conservative reaction, McCarthyism, and racial tensions. But as aspirational goals for the most assertive forms of American liberalism, they have yet to be topped. Along with economic liberalism, developing on parallel but distinct lines is social liberalism. While this is now defined by a broad spectrum embrace of groups marginalized on the basis of racial, sexual, and ethnic identity, traditionally the question of social liberalism for Democrats has been fundamentally a question of how to adapt to the black freedom struggle. One could profitably spend a lifetime investigating this question. For our purposes, we are going to focus on two of the most important rhetorical statements on this question that have so far been produced in this century. We begin with Jeremiah Wright, retired senior pastor of Trinity United Church in Chicago, a predominantly black church that is a member of the United Church of Christ, a descendant of the New England Congregationalists. In 2003, in April, as American troops occupied Baghdad, he delivered a sermon called Confusing God and Government that featured a sustained Christian criticism of American imperialism. Wright's sermons were often political. There is a long tradition of political sermonizing in America in both white and black churches. Despite the official secularism of the state, religious organizations have served as springboards for political organizing among both liberals and conservatives. In Wright's case, the political content of his sermons derives from traditions in the black church that go back to Reconstruction. Churches served as mobilizing points for a newly free people with no institutions of their own. The political importance of the church was confirmed by the imposition of Jim Crow, which forced Southern blacks from political life. Decades later, the network sustained by these Southern churches would provide the organizing structure for the civil rights movement. The inescapable reality of black political dispossession has produced a blunt and bracing critique of the American system expressed in a Christian idiom. In this sense, Wright expresses one version of a deeply rooted style of American politics. Call it the prophetic style. We might most closely associate this style of politics with Martin Luther King's campaign against Jim Crow. The tactics were democratic, participatory, and passive. The rhetoric was intensely religious in a way that blended biblical morality with American ideals. It demanded that people change their hearts as well as their institutions. This style of politics has been present from the founding of the colonies. It does not belong to liberals or conservatives and has been repeatedly deployed by both. But as we see in Wright's sermon, liberal and left-leaning prophetic politics relies on sustained criticisms of American empire and American hubris. It directly attacks the smug superiority often associated with the idea of American exceptionalism and demands a reckoning with the crimes of our common past. This is not a style of politics that typically infiltrates the senior leadership of institutions like Congress and the presidency. To the extent that this style of politics is successful in mobilizing people to act, elected leaders may seek to work with these movements, a process that necessarily involves compromise. Consider the Democratic Party's absorption of the civil rights movement. This decision determined the next 50 years of American political development, as Democrats pledged to become the party that would implement the civil rights agenda. This move immediately created a cleavage within the movement, as advocates of compromise and advocates of militancy clashed over the question of how to wield power through the Democratic Party, or whether that was even possible at all. On the one hand, black voters are today an essential pillar of the Democratic base, and black officials are common in the party. 
But on the other hand, the political radicalism implicit in the civil rights movement, expressed in sermons like Wright's, was marginalized. That kind of stark moral urgency was not useful in winning elections, if for no other reason than that it easily alienated voters who were less than enthusiastic about the outcome of the civil rights revolution. So, in 2008, when Barack Obama was on the verge of becoming the first African American to win a major party's nomination for president, excerpts of Wright's sermon were publicized. In these excerpts, Wright is heard to say, God damn America in the sense that the country deserves God's judgment. This is an entirely unremarkable sentiment in American religious rhetoric, but in the context of a presidential election, it mattered that a black pastor said these things. The Obama campaign treated this as a very serious problem. Wright's sermon had been delivered in the context of the Iraq War, an invasion that many liberals like Wright viewed as an egregious criminal act, and that in 2008, one that still split the party severely between opponents and supporters of the war. For Obama to credibly present himself as a sober, temperate politician, he had to distance himself from Wright, but he had to do so without alienating the black voters who strongly identified with Wright's point of view and Obama's candidacy. This speech, a more perfect union, was the response. Note that Obama leaned into the autobiographical themes of his campaign in this speech, identifying his own mixed-race heritage and cosmopolitan childhood as an embodiment of the agonized and complex history of American race relations. From there, he moves to his central theme of unity. The fantasy of national unity is one of the most durable fantasies in American life, in no small part because it has been a favorite theme of talented communicators like Barack Obama. Here, Obama claims that despite the conflicts that cut through American history, there is a deeper unity that makes progress possible. Eager to move away from Wright's insistence that the United States take account of the crimes it has committed, Obama appeals to this unity as he asks his listeners to instead have faith that change is possible. Here, Obama suggests that Wright's view implies a static society in which the harm of racism cannot really be overcome. But though he distances himself from any implied radicalism in Wright's critique, Obama goes further than many other Democratic Party leaders of the time by acknowledging that this radicalism was the rational product of long and bitter experience in a country that preached freedom while practicing apartheid. This basic fact of American life has been historically obscured by a great many tactics, but at times this obscurity wanes and the unavoidable reality provokes a new response. We have seen in the past year the largest protest wave in American history, a protest wave founded on the still incomplete black liberation struggle. For the first time in decades, Democratic Party orthodoxies have been shaken, and the 20th century liberalism of economic and racial inequality has re-emerged in a decidedly 21st century form. What successes and failures this new iteration of liberalism will have remains to be seen.